Hello, everyone. Welcome to our daily growth book overview for chapter one of Galatians. My name is Michael Fondanova, one of the pastors at the Wayward Outreach, and I'm excited to dive into our second book of the daily growth book, the book of Galatians. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this book since it's our first foray into it. First, the author of this book is Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, author of 14 of the 27 books in the New Testament, most of which are like this book, our letter to a person or a church. Now, Galatians is a little bit different uh, in that it's written to a group of churches in a region known as Galatia. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. Paul writes what we call the book of Galatians in approximately 49 AD. This is about 15 years after his initial conversion on the road to Damascus. And he's writing, as I mentioned, to the region of Galatia, which could be found today in modern day Turkey. Rather than writing to one specific church or to one specific person, he writes to a group of churches, which he was a part of starting on his first missionary journey, approximately five years earlier, around 44 AD. Three of those churches are located in Lystra, Iconium, and Derbe, and you can read about those churches and Paul's journey to them in Acts chapter 14. Now, the purpose of this letter, this letter is meant to refute a false teaching that believers must obey the Jewish law in order to be saved and to call Christians to faith and freedom in Christ alone. I love this letter. Now, Paul writes uh, to the churches directly to address this growing heresy, which was the most pressing controversy that believers faced in this time. This was especially important to Paul, who had already seen hundreds, if not thousands, of non-Jewish Gentiles believe and accept Jesus Christ as Lord. This false teaching now threatened to derail their growth as well as the future growth of the church by making Christianity into just another sect within the Jewish faith. While this conflict was later officially addressed at and resolved at the Jerusalem Council in AD 50, which you can read about in Acts 15, at this point in time, Paul's ministry to the Gentiles was still actively under attack by a group of former Pharisees that wanted people to continue living under the Mosaic law, eating kosher foods, being circumcised, and observing certain rituals. Paul recognized this teaching for what it truly was, an attack on the very gospel itself, and he takes a bold stance in addressing it head-on throughout the book of Galatians. Now let's look at Galatians chapter 1, which is our reading this week. To begin, greetings from Paul, verse 1. This letter is from Paul, an apostle. I was not appointed by any group of people or any human authority, but by Jesus Christ himself and by God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. All the brothers and sisters here join me in sending this letter to the churches of Galatia. May, the God, the, may God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Now Paul begins this letter in what would later be considered uncharacteristic form for him, abruptly. In his other letters, Paul tends to begin with expressions of thanks and praise, like in 1 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians. However, here in this letter, Paul begins by clarifying where his authority as an apostle comes from, Jesus Christ himself. This speaks to the seriousness of what Paul is addressing and makes clear the aim of his letter, to confront lies and boldly proclaim the truth. Now, apparently, the former Pharisees who had been teaching people that they must obey the law to be saved had begun their teaching by attacking Paul's credentials. In order to give credence to what they had to say, they knew they had to discredit what Paul had taught first. Because Paul's message was, Jesus only can save. Their message was, Jesus and obedience to the law will save. So they started rumors that Paul did not qualify as a quote-unquote true apostle. In the New Testament terms, an apostle is someone who spent time with Christ and was officially sent by him to be his representative in the world. These false teachers were saying that Paul didn't qualify since he wasn't one of the original 12 disciples and taught only what he'd heard from someone else and so had no authority to speak for Christ on his own. This attack is what prompts Paul to spend a good amount of time in this chapter explaining from the story of his life before and after conversion that none of the other apostles trained him Instead, the truth of the gospel, the only gospel, was revealed to him directly 
from Jesus Christ. So look at verse 4. Jesus gave his life for our sins, just as God our Father planned, in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. Now, in his first post-greeting sentence, Paul points the Galatians to the true gospel. Jesus gave his life for our sins. And this is something that Jesus himself pointed out truly demonstrates how much he loves us. In John 15, 13, Jesus says, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And as a famous theologian once pointed out, these words, who gave himself for our sins, are very important. He wanted to tell the Galatians straight out that atonement for sins and perfect righteousness are not to be sought anywhere but in Christ. Next, Paul uses very clear and decisive language to make the point, there is only one gospel. There's only one good news. Verse 6, I'm shocked that you are turning away so soon from God, who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news, but it is not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. Now, I'm going to pass over verses 8 and 10 just to say the good news stands on the truth that salvation comes by God's grace alone through faith alone in Christ's payment for our sin on the cross, which is what he says here in Galatians 1, 4 through 9. If it relies upon us, fallen, imperfect men, or anything that we must do, then there is nothing truly good about it. In fact, any gospel that relies on what we must do, whether religious observances or acts of faith, is not good news at all. But it's really bad news because we can never live up to the God standard on our own. That's what Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, Paul begins the defense of his ministry in earnest in verses 11 and on, stating, or excuse me, starting with his earliest personal experience with Jesus and detailing the turning his life took, the turns his life took from that point on. So look at verse 11. Dear brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that the gospel message I preach is not based on mere human reasoning. I received my message from no human source and no one taught me. Instead, I received it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. Paul is not simply referring to his conversion experience on the road to Damascus, but rather introducing the story of his life that he's about to tell. In so doing, he makes a vitally important statement. This message does not come from any human source, but from God himself. You may have heard me tell of the greatest differences between all of the world religions and Christianity. All other religions detail what man must do to draw near to God. But Christianity stands out above all the rest because it's not about what man does to draw near to God, but rather what God did to draw near to man. And here we see Paul's message was not a man's attempt to reach up and understand God, as these Pharisees are accusing him, but rather God's choice to reach down and reveal himself to a man. And that's the story of the gospel. Look at verse 13. You know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion, how I violently persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for the traditions of my ancestors. I love verse 15. But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Then it pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. Now God called Paul by his marvelous grace, just as each one of us is called. There was nothing Paul could have done to earn this. He makes that even more clear by stating that it happened, quote, even before I was born. Long before Paul had done anything to deserve, to deserve it, God called him. This powerful truth plays a massive role throughout this entire letter to the Galatian churches. It's never been about what we can do. It has always been and always will be about what God has done and will do. When this happened, continuing on, when this happened, I did not rush out to consult with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before I was. Instead, I went away to Arabia, and later I returned to the city of Damascus. Then, three years later, I went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter, and I stayed with him for 15 days. The only other apostle I met at that time was James, the Lord's brother. I declare before God that what I'm writing you 
writing to you is not a lie. Now, it was nearly seven and a half years after Paul's conversion that he finally meets with the other apostles. In the last half of chapter 1, Paul makes it clear that his gospel is true and his experience valid simply because it came from not men, but God. If it had any other source, it would have been invalid. But since it did come from Christ directly to Paul, it can be trusted. And it was only validated long after the fact by those same apostles. Verse 21 says, After that visit, I went north into the provinces of Syria and Cilicia, and still the churches in Christ that are in Judea didn't know me personally. All they knew was that people were saying, The one who used to persecute us is now preaching the very faith he tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. So throughout the first 15 years or more of Paul's ministry, he spent it in relative obscurity. First, alone for three years in a desert. Second, as a distrusted member of a church in a city that had already tried to kill him. Then, as a largely unknown minister, where the only thing that was known of him was his sordid, painful history as a persecutor of the church. But through it all, God got the glory and sinners were brought to repentance. In the coming chapters, we're going to see how Paul's conversion further demonstrates that salvation comes by faith in Jesus Christ alone. He'll encourage the Galatian churches to consider their own experience of the gospel and to take a closer look at what the Old Testament teaches about grace, ultimately making the most important point of this book, this letter. We are saved by faith, not by keeping the law. This is in Galatians chapter 5. So I hope you've enjoyed this overview of Galatians chapter 1, and I can't wait to dive into the rest of our daily growth book passage with you in the coming weeks. God bless you, and we'll see you soon.